Dear guests, colleagues, and members of the ATES Silk Road Civilizations Forum, it is a privilege to be giving here this talk today upon the kind invitation of the ATES and having this opportunity to share my research with you. Since ATES is concerned with the transnational and transcultural transmissions and exchanges along the Silk Road, I will be talking today about something similar in the realm of text, more specifically the exchange of the technology of writing and literacy along the Silk Road. So the title of my talk is Tools of Literacy, Chinese Primers Along the Silk Road. I primarily work on Chinese texts, and in recent years I've been working more and more on primers. That is, these texts that were specifically written for the purpose of being used by children or young adults on the way to acquiring literacy. And one of the arguments I'm trying to make here that these primers are essentially a technology. This is why I call them tools of literacy. And my other point I'd like to emphasize today is that Buddhism was a major force in the spread of literacy and the spread of the Chinese script in East and Central Asia, because Chinese Buddhist texts spread to areas around China both to the east and also to the north and the west and even to the south, Chinese texts traveled along with Buddhism. Along with the text, the Chinese script also spread to many areas beyond what we might consider today China. And as part of this process, primers that were initially designed for teaching Chinese, they also spread to areas around China and were used to teach Chinese, but were also translated and possibly played a role in teaching other languages than Chinese. And the time frame for the spread of Chinese texts and primers beyond the Chinese border is somewhere from about the 5th century to the beginning of the Mongol period, that is the second half of the 13th century. Of course, this process doesn't stop there, but I think with the appearance of the Mongols on the scene, the history of East and Central Asia completely changes, and that brings in the beginning of an entirely new period, ultimately leading to the modern period. So my interest in the preceding period is partly pragmatic because I need to limit the time scope of my inquiry, but it is also justified by seeing the history of China and East Asia in general as an entirely new period from when the Mongols come in. And it is, of course, very well known that Chinese Buddhist texts have spread to Korea, Japan, and even to Vietnam in the South. And along with Buddhist texts, there were also a multitude of other texts, including primers that went to these countries. And these are the countries that continue to use the Chinese script well into the modern period, and in many ways inherited the Chinese written tradition and considered it as part of their own history. But because this process is well known, and it has been explored quite a bit by other scholars, I will direct my attention to the northwest of the Chinese dynasties, to the region we also commonly call the Silk Road. And this is a region that is less commonly recognized as being the home of cultures and peoples who were engaged in using Chinese texts, reading them in the original, and also translating them, including, of course, primers. But first, let's say a few words about the concept of primers. I really see them as part of the technology of writing or the technology of literacy. Uh, they are tools that facilitate the acquisition of literacy and also teach basic cultural information. Because of that, they feature prominently in the earliest narratives of the history of writing in China. This begins already in the Han Dynasty, where the famous bibliographic treatise on literature in the Book of the Han, Han Shu, from the end of the first century AD, describes the compilation of three new primers, specifically for the sake of teaching the newly reformed Qin script. This was following the Qin conquest of the other states in 221, the famous episode known as the unification of China by the first emperor. And quite interestingly, archaeological discoveries have yielded examples of primers from the Qin and Han period, most notably the Jijiu Pian and the Tang Jie Pian. These are two primers that survive to this day. And most of these early primers were written on slips of wood or bamboo, but there were also several on more durable writing supports, such as stone or terracotta. The acquisition of literary skills in general was seen as the initial step towards one day becoming a professional scribe. 
So it seems that literacy was not a goal for the general population, but it was directed towards a group of professionals who were to become scribes. And moving forward to the time of paper manuscripts, we have a considerable number of surviving manuscripts and fragments uh, showing that Chinese primers were quite popular in scribal cultures throughout East and Central Asia. Perhaps because paper survives better in desert climate, most of the surviving paper manuscripts, including many primers, come from Western China. Among the earlier examples are fragments of the Zizhu Pian from Lolan, which probably date to the 4th century CE. These fragments belong to the same sheet of paper and contain the beginning portion of the text. One side has the text in parallel columns, written in regular and cursive scripts, probably serving as a template for copying, whereas on the other side, we see the text in a less practiced hand, so maybe that side was written by a student. The manuscripts find show that from the 6th century onward, the most popular primer was the Tianzi Wen, the thousand character text. At least a dozen copies of this text survive from Turfan and almost three times as many from the Dunhuang Library Cave. The earliest dated Dunhuang copy is Paleo Xinhua 3561 and it has a colophon which says, record made by Jiang Shanjin of having finished tracing this copy in the seventh month of the 15th year of the Zhengguan era, and that date corresponds to 641. The colophon here specifically uses the word lin, which means tracing, that is making a reproduction. The implication is that the person who copied the text actually intended to replicate not only the text on the source manuscript, but also its layout and calligraphy. This manuscript is written in a skilled hand and on very good quality paper, suggesting that this was not a personal copy uh, made for the sake of practice, but instead an exemplar of some significance. And because of that, the function of this copy, and maybe also other copies of the Tianzi Wen in this period, was to practice calligraphy rather than teaching school children how to read and write. This, of course, fits well with the legend according to which Zhou Xingzi composed the text from individual characters written by the famous calligrapher Wang Xizhi, and that these had been copied onto individual sheets of paper. Now, if we move forward in time, we have quite a few copies of the Tianzi Wen from Dunhuang from the 9th and 10th centuries, and these, for the most part, were copied by students as writing exercise. One such example is manuscript S3835, the recto, or the front side of which, has three primers. One is the Taikong Jia Jiao, the family instructions of the Grand Duke, the Thousand Character Classic, and the Bai Niao Ming, names of the hundred birds, and they're copied in succession. A colophon at the end states that the texts were copied in the Geng Yin year by a certain Suo Pu Zi. Uh, this Geng Yin year possibly corresponds to the year 930. The Thousand Character Classic had diverse functions, and it would be too simple just to regard it as a list of a thousand common characters that had to be acquired by school children. It is called a Thousand Character Text because it contains a thousand unique characters, and so in a sense it was ideal for learning these characters, but it, it's commonly recognized that it had quite a few other functions. For example, to practice calligraphy. In addition, it encoded in very short, like four character segments, a large amount of traditional tropes, quotes and allusions. And if children memorized the text, then after having memorized it, they sort of had access to this information. They could always unpack it if it was necessary. So essentially the text served as a tool that facilitated the storing and retrieval of cultural and historical knowledge. And related to its mnemonic application, the text also served as a numbering or ordering sequence similar to how the alphabet is employed in Western cultures for marking items in a list. The text was so popular and so intimately connected with elementary education that all literate people would have known it by heart, which made it ideal for numbering longer lists. For example, 
one well-known application was uh, numbering the bundles of the Buddhist canon, which were marked with sequential characters from this text as a way of organizing them. This is evidenced by some of the sutra wrappers preserved in Dunhuang, and on some of them, the characters of the Thousand Character Classic are still legible. And beside this text, there were also other common primers, and one of them is the Taihong Jia Jiao, just mentioned, that is the family instructions of the Grand Duke. This text was also arranged into four character segments, but was more literary in terms of its content. Among the Tunhuang manuscripts, student colophones help us identify a group of about 150 manuscripts that were produced in an educational setting at local monasteries. Based on the colophones, we can roughly date this activity to the second half of the 9th through the end of the 10th centuries, uh, which is a period that followed the end of the Tibetan control of the region, which ended in 848. So we can see that among these manuscripts, there are also several other texts that are not normally considered primers, but they have the same function here. The most conspicuous among these are the Analects of Confucius, the classic of filial piety, and also a few poems, such as the Laments of Lady Chin and the Rhapsody of the Swallow. And if we move beyond these 150 manuscripts with student colophones and examine other copies of, say, the classic of filial piety, it is clear that many of them are very similar in how they look and how they're written to the manuscripts that bear students' colophones. That basically means that the group of manuscripts produced by these students was actually much larger, but only a portion of them were assigned and have these colophones. But of course, Dunhuang was not the only place where manuscripts of primers were found. So copies of the same text, for example, the thousand character text, were also found elsewhere, for example, in Turfan. And what I'm specifically interested in um, in this paper is the translation of Chinese primers into other languages, not just the spread of primers in Chinese, as it happened, for example, to Japan and Korea, but also the, the translation into local languages. And we can document this phenomenon at sites along the Silk Road. While some regions or states adopted the Chinese script and along with the Chinese text, there were also states that, in addition to doing this, had their own script, which was not Chinese, and then they translated the Chinese primers into their respective languages. Most of the archaeologically excavated translations of primers are in three languages. That is in Tibetan, Old Uyghur, and Tangut. Even though these three languages are only three of several major written languages around China during this period. The Tibetans derive their alphabet from the Brahmi script, the Uyghurs from the Sogdian, and ultimately the Aramaic scripts, whereas the Tanguts developed their own script on Chinese inspiration. So they invented a script that looked quite a bit like Chinese, but was not Chinese. And the fact that we have larger groups of manuscripts and printed texts in these three languages is probably a coincidence and maybe in the future there'll be discoveries in the other languages. But manuscripts in each of these three languages present an interesting scenario for the ways in which Chinese primers were adopted into another linguistic environment. So let's look at the Tibetan case. Most of the early Tibetan manuscripts come from Dunhuang, which from the last third of the 8th century until the middle of the 9th century, was under Tibetan military and political control. But it, quite interestingly, even after this control ceased and the Tibetan Empire withdrew, Tibetans remained a very strong cultural force for the following centuries. And so the surviving manuscripts show that Chinese and Tibetan culture impacted each other in a variety of ways, including scribal practices and Buddhist rituals. Although most of the texts translated from Chinese into Tibetan are of Buddhist content, there was also demand for specifically non-Buddhist literature among the Tibetans. For example, the old book of Tang, the Jiu Tang Shu, 
records that in 730, the Tibetans asked for copies of some of the Confucian classics and also the literary anthology Wenxuan selected writings. And they claimed that their request was based on the suggestion of the Tang princess, Tin Cheng, who had been given in marriage to the Tibetan emperor. This marriage was part of this policy of maintaining amicable relations between the Tang court and neighboring states. So there was an imperial edict that ordered the copies to be prepared and then delivered to the Tibetans, even though there was actual opposition to this from ministers who thought that these texts might give the Tibetans some military and administrative expertise, which was something the Tang court wouldn't want. So this information comes from Chinese historical sources. Looking at the manuscript evidence, of course, we're mainly looking at what survived in Dunhuang. And here, Tibetan translations of secular texts are quite few. Among these is a Tibetan version of the Shangshu, the Book of History. There's another interesting text which was initially identified by Yoshiro Imaeda as a translation of the Zhang Guozhe, the Stratagems of the Warring States. But later on, Chinese scholars realized that was, this was actually a translation of another text, the Chunqiu Hoyu, later comments on the Spring and Autumn Annals. There's also another historical text, which is a passage from the Shiji, the Records of the Historian, and this passage was incorporated into chapter 4 of the Old Tibetan Chronicle. So it's not marked as a translation, but uh, we can trace the text to this Chinese historical work. And if we look specifically for primers, then we can see that there are three extant copies of the Kongzi Xiang Tou Xiang Wen Shu, which is a dialogue between Confucius and this smart boy called Xiang Tou, and this primer survived in Chinese original in nearly 20 copies in Dunhuang. But there are three copies of it also in Tibetan. One of the Chinese copies is dated to 943, so the mid-10th century. And this kind of provides an approximate time frame when the text was in circulation in Dunhuang. But this was actually a text that was composed earlier, during the early or mid-Tang period, so two, three hundred years earlier. And this is also the text that uh, survived into the modern age, but with a different title. For example, in the Ming Dynasty, it appears in a book under the title Xiao Er Lun, Discussion with the Child. The Tibetan manuscripts were studied by the French Dunhuang scholar Michel Soamier, who compared them with versions in other languages, including both classical Chinese and vernacular, and then Thai and Mongolian, there were also a similar version in Japanese, which was included in this anthology called Konjaku Monogatari Shu. Another related text that survives in two Tibetan copies was initially studied by Rolf Stein, who called him Maxim Confucianist. And this is a collection of short allusions to Chinese literary and historical texts, which is quite similar to some of the other primers. A few years ago, Saren Gawa drew attention to a Tibetan manuscript in the collection of the Nakamura Museum of Calligraphy in Tokyo, which was published shortly before that. So earlier, we didn't have access to these texts, and this is why they only surfaced then. So in that collection, there was a Tibetan manuscript, uh, which had two texts, and the second one was titled Old Instructions of Tai Kung. And this text was very similar to the two paleo manuscripts called by Rolf Stein, Maxim Confucianist. There was quite a bit of overlap between them. Uh, because of the Tibetan title, Old Instructions of Tai Kung, it was relatively straightforward to connect it with the Chinese text, Family Instructions of the Grand Duke. So the Grand Duke is Tai Kung. Tai Kung is simply the Chinese word for it, and the Tibetan translation didn't translate this, only treated it as a proper noun, uh, transliterating it. So the Tibetan manuscripts, they have quite a bit of overlap with the Chinese version, but they're not fully identical to it. But they also have some overlap with other Chinese primers from Dunhuang. So it's quite interesting how the text changed and what happened 
whether it was translated from a, a different Chinese version or the change happened in Tibetan or possibly during the process of translation. In addition to translations, another fascinating group of texts um, that kind of shows us how complex the linguistic situation in Dunhuang was are Tibetan transcriptions of Chinese texts. A manuscript that received quite a bit of scholarly attention from early on is a copy of the 1,000 character text with Tibetan transcriptions next to the Chinese characters. So this was originally published by Hane Datoru in 1923, and since then has been studied by quite a few scholars. The Chinese text is complete, but the transcription doesn't go all the way to the end. It stops like 128 characters before the end. And this manuscript may have been produced for the sake of someone who could not read Chinese characters, or as a study tool to ensure the correct pronunciation of Chinese words. And two other Chinese texts transcribed phonetically using the Tibetan alphabet are the Zha Chao miscellaneous jottings and the Jiu Jiu Biao, so nine times nine table. And both were copied sometime after the end of the Tibetan rule of Dunhuang. So these are very small fragments. The miscellaneous jottings is very close uh, to the beginning of the Chinese text by this title from Dunhuang even though there are some smaller discrepancies. And this nine times nine table, so it's a multiplication table, is an even shorter fragment, probably from the 10th century, because it has a reference to a Khotanese envoy. And these contacts with Khotan actually date to the 10th century. These Tibetan transcriptions were probably intended as auxiliary material for Chinese students, to help them during the early stages of learning by enabling them to read texts in a phonetic script because it was much simpler to learn the phonetic Tibetan alphabet and they could use it as a help while they were learning to read and write Chinese. But it's also possible that people who use these transcriptions were Tibetan speakers who engaged in a Chinese form of Buddhism and the recited Chinese text as part of their liturgical practices, but were not necessarily literate in Chinese. So maybe for primers this is less likely, but it's also possible that we're dealing with more than one scenario. Of course, some of this activity may have been the result of kind of unique local conditions at Dunhuang, where both languages were common uh, during the 9th and 10th centuries. But we also have to acknowledge that the need to interact with Chinese culture would have been also a concern beyond this region and beyond this particular period. Even though we do not have a large amount of manuscripts from other places, these kind of phenomena maybe were also happening elsewhere at other times. So the second language we should look at is Old Uyghur. And the surviving Old Uyghur texts include many which were translated from Chinese. The translations, they range from Mahayana sutras and apocryphal scriptures, but then also include a small number of non-Buddhist works. And Chinese histories record that already in the second half of the 6th century, the people in Gaochang used Chinese writing alongside their own script and read some of the Confucian classics, such as the Book of Odes and the Analects of Confucius, a classic of filial piety, by pronouncing them in their own language. And although reading them in another language would have been technically equivalent to translating them, the manuscripts themselves remained in the original language, that is in Chinese. And indeed, we have numerous Chinese copies of such texts excavated from the Turfan region corroborating uh, the popularity of these works there. And some of the copies carry teachers' corrections or assessments, showing that they were produced within an educational setting. There are only a few surviving fragments of Chinese secular works in Old Uyghur. Professor Peter Zima wrote about these series of quotes from Confucian classics, which appeared in Uyghur translations of Buddhist texts especially the biography of Xuanzang. So these were mainly quotes cited in other works. They were not entire texts translated in their own right. 
among the texts that were actually translated, the most important is the thousand character text, which survives in at least five different manuscripts from the Turfan region. Uh, there are some overlaps between them, and altogether, there probably about half of the text survives in Old Uyghur translation. The Old Uyghur versions have been studied by several scholars, most notably by professors Shogaito Masahiro, Peter Tsima, and Abdurishid Yakub, and they describe the variety of ways uh, in which the text was arranged. For example, several fragments from the Krotkov collection in St. Petersburg begin each four-character segment by writing out the first Chinese character of that segment, but then instead of the second, third, and fourth character, they just use horizontal lines, kind of indicating where they are, but not writing them out. And then they add the Uyghur translation of the entire segment below. The fact that the Chinese text is represented by the first character of each segment either means that the students had already committed the text to memory, or maybe more likely that the Chinese characters were only inserted as reference anchors and the students primarily handled the text in Uyghur. In other versions, a phonetic transcription in the Uyghur script precedes the translation and sometimes also the Chinese characters themselves. So in such cases, when the transcription comes before the translation, the Uyghurs probably first vocalized the Chinese text using their so-called inherited pronunciation and then also read the text in Old Uyghur. This reading technique is known to us from Japan, where it's called Monzen Yomi, that is the style of reading the, the Chinese text Wenxuan, literary anthology. In Japan, this, this technique appeared as early as the 10th century, but was largely discontinued by the 16th century. And the thousand character text is pretty much the only text that continued to be read in this manner. The Uyghur translation itself essentially meant a reading similar to the Japanese practice of Kundoku. But why did the Uyghurs need the thousand character text? It is, after all, a text that arranges a thousand Chinese characters into a mnemonic sequence and was used by Chinese speakers to teach basic literacy skills. The text itself is not that engaging and it has a multitude of allusions which would have been very difficult for Uyghur students who were probably less familiar with Chinese history because there are surviving fragments in both Chinese and Old Uyghur it is clear that the Uyghurs studied the text in both languages. To me, it seems that Chinese texts in general played an important role in Uyghur literacy, and also that the thousand character text in particular uh, was part of the technical apparatus accompanying the Chinese script. Because Uyghurs primarily relied on Chinese characters to read Chinese Buddhist texts, and the thousand character text offered a uh, function as this very reliable or well-tested tool that helped the acquisition process. And it is actually a fact that the old Uyghur fragments of the thousand character text typically have Chinese Buddhist texts on the other side. So texts like the Lotus Sutra or the Mahaprajna Paramita Sutra and this shows that the principal application of the thousand character text would have been in connection with reading Buddhist texts. And quite interestingly, uh, recently, Professor Abdurishid Yakub published an article about a colophon to a copy of the thousand character text. And this was written by a certain Xing Tsun Tutong. And Professor Yakub argued that in addition to its educational function, the thousand character text may have also been considered as having apotropaic qualities, so like talismanic qualities. And the manuscript uh, where this colophon appears is a small booklet from Turfan, and it features a, an unusually clumsy hand. And even though the colophon is written in Chinese characters, uh, the word order suggests that it was actually written in Old Uyghur. So the script is Chinese, but the language is Uyghur.
and located on the other side of a scroll with a Buddhist text, namely the Sekis Yukmak Yarok Sodor, so the, the Chinese scripture of the divine spell of the eight yang of heaven and earth, is the old Uyghur translation of the Chinese primer Kaimeng Yao Xun, Essential Teachings for Beginners. This was a text of 1014 characters divided into 350 segments, and it was very popular both in China and beyond. There's also evidence that it was used in Japan. In China, it was lost during the Mongol period, but there were about 40 copies surviving among the Dunhong manuscripts, so in Chinese. The old Uyghur version, identified by Professor Tsima only recently, does not include the Chinese characters, but it marks their place with slanting strokes, helping Uyghur readers to find their way in the text. And finally, the third language I wanted to look at is Tangut. As in the case of the Tibetan and Uyghur translations, the majority of surviving Tangut texts are Buddhist in nature, but there's also a small group of non-Buddhist works translated from Chinese. And these include like Confucian classics, military treatises, medical works, and also primers. And we also know from Chinese historical sources that when the Tango script was invented in 1036, the classic of filial piety and the thesaurus Arya, and then the Si and Zazi, the miscellaneous characters in four syllables, were the first texts to be translated into Tango. And so these are recorded as being translated together with kind of the invention of the script. So the script was invented and then these three things were translated and it's very likely that they were linked with the acquisition of literacy. And so it's clear that the adoption of primers played a vital role in the introduction of the new script. And the Tango script, as I mentioned earlier, was invented anew they did not adopt an existing script, but they invented their own based on the Chinese example, but also made it quite different from the Chinese. And much of the Tangut material survives from ruins of the city of Karakoto, deep in the desert, which was only rediscovered in the early 20th century in 1908. And it also includes a large number of Chinese texts, but also Tangut texts and also some Tibetan ones. And there are also copies of the Thousand Character text and other Chinese primers in Chinese at this site. But quite interestingly, there are also translations of some of these. So, for example, there's a Tangut copy of the classic of filial piety, and it includes a, a lost commentary by the Chinese scholar Lü Huiqing. But this is written in a cursive hand, and it has this scholarly commentary. So that indicates that this copy was probably not used as a primer, but it was more of a scholarly text, not a text used in primary education. But it nevertheless confirms the existence of a Tango translation of this text. There's also a Tango text with the title uh, Miscellaneous Characters of the Three Realms which was reconstructed into Chinese as San Cai Zha Zi. This text seems to have been quite popular because there are several copies and fragments, and it seems that it was composed in the Tango state, so it was not a translation of a Chinese text, but it, it emulates Chinese-style primers, which are also called Zha Zi, so miscellane miscellaneous characters. So it was inspired by a Chinese model, there's also another Tango text, the title of which doesn't survive, but it was named by modern scholars as excerpts from the classics and histories. And it basically quotes a Chinese texts like literary texts and the classics. And it also contains quotes from the family instructions of the Grand Duke, which was actually not part of this elite literary canon. Quite interesting, this, this Tango text is conspicuously crude, and has quite a few glaring mistakes. And scholars had long suspected that this must have been a translation of a Chinese original, but only recently they've been able to link it with the Chinese text. With the primer that survived in Tunhong, this is the Xinji Wen Si Jiu Jing Chao, 
newly collected excerpts from the nine classics. So the Chinese version survives in Dunhuang in over a dozen copies. And even though the Chinese and the Tango texts are not fully identical, they share like 170 matching sections, and then there are 57 sections that don't match. But they also share some of the mistakes, which shows that there is a, there is a direct textual link between them. Once again, the question is whether the discrepancies between the Chinese and the Tango text are due to the Tango translator relying on a different Chinese version or because the Tango translator changed the text or modified it. There are also some bilingual works, some of which uh, would have been used in primary education. And the most famous of these is a glossary called the Tango Chinese Timely Pearl in the Palm, which consists of thematically grouped Tangut and Chinese words aligned side by side, including the pronunciation in both languages. It is clear that this was an interlingual learning tool that worked in either direction, depending on the language of the user. It was not a translation of a Chinese text, but a glossary tailored for local needs in the Tangut state. And all this material shows that the Tanguts were highly interested in translating not only Chinese Buddhist texts and even Confucian classics, but also works associated with elementary learning, so primers. Even though it is clear that, as it was the case among the Tibetans and Uyghurs, they used some of these texts as part of this process of interacting with Chinese writings, they also use them within the context of learning to read and write in Tangut. This relates to this record that the invention of the Tangut script was accompanied by the translation of the classical filial piety, the thesaurus aria, and the miscellaneous words in four characters, and none of which would, at that point, would have been intended to study Chinese texts. So instead, the translations of these three works were clearly meant to provide practical tools for learning the new script and enhancing Tangut literacy skills. And thinking about the possible differences with the case of the Tibetans and the Uyghurs, we can perhaps think about the fact that the Tangut script was not borrowed from elsewhere. Instead, it was a new invention inspired by the Chinese example, which meant that structurally or even visually it shared some of the characteristics of the Chinese script, even though it was completely unintelligible for Chinese users. But maybe because of the typological similarities between the two scripts, the translations of Chinese primers would have also worked for teaching Tangut. So above, I talked about these three main languages into which Chinese primers were translated, mainly based on archaeological material. And so what do we learn from this? By all accounts, the Tang Sui unification of China at the end of the 6th century and the beginning of the 7th was of major importance for the political structure of East and Central Asia. It created a dynamic empire that, for the first time in many centuries, managed to live up to the legacy of the Han Dynasty and gain control over this vast territory referred to as All Under Heaven, that is Tianxia. And although from the mid 8th century forward, the Tang lost its power base and also its Central Asian territories, Chinese texts remained influential throughout East and Central Asia. Archaeological evidence tells us that actually precisely during this period, that is when the Tang gets weaker, and in the period after that, so a period of fragmentation, that many Chinese texts, including primers, were translated into local languages by China's neighbors. And it's quite revealing that this process happened not while the Tang dynasty was at the height of its power, but in the period when it was weaker, during the period of fragmentation after the collapse of the Tang. This was a time of growth for local powers outside of China, and these states, they needed scripts and texts in their quest for political legitimation and bureaucratic governance. This presentation aimed to show that Chinese primers were actively used by a variety of peoples speaking other languages, non-Chinese languages, throughout Inner Asia. These peoples and cultures interacted with Chinese primers in many different ways, ranging from reading those in their original language, that is in Chinese, through vocalizing them according to their own complex system of reading, 
also to translating them into their own languages. And archaeological material tells us that this is not a phenomenon unique to these sites. In fact, this is observable almost everywhere where we find larger quantities of text, especially texts in multiple languages. So this was the norm rather than an exception. And while this kind of engagement with Chinese primers is relatively well documented in Japan and Korea, there has been much less attention paid to it with regards to the states along the northern and western peripheries of the Chinese empires. And my presentation aimed to show that actually very similar processes were happening there as well. So this was not only something happening in East Asia, but also in Inner Asia. This is my presentation. Thank you for listening. I'm very much looking forward to your questions and to the discussion. Thank you very much.